Hello, welcome to our special edition webinar session. We are about to start soon. Please get yourself ready and comfortable for this session. Thank you. So the types of resources on employer obligations that apply can generally be broken down into two different categories. Your main one would be the legal sources, meaning the laws itself, the acts, the legislation. And this is actually online and available to the public. It's available on a website called Singapore Statute Online. But I appreciate it, you know, looking at the laws itself can be a bit daunting or a bit hard to digest for some of us, you know, especially like lay people who are not really used to looking to such uh, legislation or such wording. So maybe a tip that I can share with you is that most law firms, right, would typically publish legal updates or summaries, which would, you know, try to summarize these new laws and try to explain it in a more digestible way. And it's, it's actually a good idea to actually subscribe to these law updates. And a lot of law firms, including Kind and Kind and Co, we do provide email subscriptions and you can actually just subscribe for free and keep updated on, on what's going on. Okay, so on this slide, I've highlighted some of the more relevant regulations here. Employers in particular will want to pay more attention to the workplace measures to prevent spread of COVID-19. Okay, the next category would be government advisories and guidelines. So you can refer to the various government websites for this, such as gov.sg, you know, the MOH website, the MPI website, and of course, most importantly, the MOM website. Okay, so now moving on to the obligations itself. So I think we all know all activities at workplaces are currently suspended, other than for certain prescribed essential services and entities who have received an approved exemption. This basically means that employers who don't fit into the essential services category or have not received you know, an approved exemption will need to commit, uh, conduct all business uh, through telecommute arrangements. So if not, then the employer's activities will need to be suspended during the circuit breaker period. So I think some of you may also be concerned about you know, how to tell if you're essential service or not. Because even though there's a list on, on Go Business website, you know, some of you may be wondering, what if I'm not sure? What if there's a good area? Well, there's actually an enterprise hotline that you can call in and ask for more information. So if you're unsure, it's best to just go ahead and that and air on the first portion. Okay, so employers are also expected to provide their employees with facilities required to enable them to work from home unless it's not reasonably practicable. So the, the exact standards for this are not legally prescribed. So what, what should employers do? I think it's probably reasonable for employers to provide you know, the employees at least remote IT access to enable them to do their work, as well as maybe access to a laptop or computer, especially if this is not something that the employee already has at home. Next, safe distancing measures. So there are a number of steps to take for this. Um, the type of safe distancing measures that the government expects to be implemented would be, for example, having split teams where you implement a split team arrangement to minimize interaction between different groups of employees, uh, staggering the arrival and departure type of employees at least one hour in between different groups, you know, and take steps to ensure a one meter distance between any two employees at the workplace. You also have to require any employees who show any of the specified symptoms. And when I say specified symptoms, I basically mean, you know, coughing, sneezing, restlessness, or running nose. And these people would have to immediately inform the employer. Okay, communication. This is also another obligation. 
uh, employers should communicate to all employees and other affected individuals about the types of measures implemented which apply to them. Okay, so most employers would typically be occupiers of a workplace, meaning that they occupy or have control of workplace premises. And as occupiers, employers would therefore also have certain additional obligations. Firstly, employers as, as the uh, occupiers would have to allow natural ventilation at the workplace during working hours to the extent that it's reasonably practicable. Secondly, the employer must ensure that they take the temperature of every individual entering the workplace and check if the individual has any symptoms, especially visible symptoms. Thirdly, collect the contact details of individuals entering the workplace. This includes non-employees and in particular non-employees actually. If there are any individuals who have a fever or have any of the specified symptoms uh, or, or individuals who don't actually comply with temperature testing or don't want to provide their contact details, these people should not be allowed to enter the workplace premises at all. Okay, so what do you do if there are any individuals who actually have a fever or have any uh, cough or are sneezing or breathless or have a runny nose? Or they, uh, they basically need to be made to wear a mask and they have to leave the workplace immediately. But sometimes, you know, it's not possible for them to leave immediately for various reasons. They could be unconscious or something like that. They would then, you need to make sure that that person is isolated. Okay, next, observing movement control measures. So if an employee is subject to a movement control order, for example, they're under quarantine or they're under staple notice, uh, the employer must not allow or require them to actually enter the workplace. Okay, so employers are not the only ones with obligations, employees as well. Uh, employees and other individuals are also required to ensure that they do not enter the workplace if they have fever or any of the specified symptoms. All right, so now we, now we all want to know, you know what happens if you don't actually comply with these obligations? What is the worst possible thing that could happen to you? So if you don't actually comply, uh, if you have a breach of the workplace measures regulations, you could actually face a fine of up to $10,000 or imprisonment of up to six months or both. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are also some MOM advisories and guidelines which will apply um, that, that you should go to the website to have a look at. And these guidelines may not necessarily be legally binding, um, but nonetheless, they are highly persuasive. You know, employers are expected to abide by these advisories and guidelines. And even if they may not have the force of law at this point in time, um, there are still consequences that may happen that if you don't abide by it. And, and one that we've been seeing quite often is naming and shaming. So the Ministry of Manpower, I think you, if, if you read the news, you've seen they're being quite proactive in actually naming and shaming your errant employers, which obviously is not really good for your business reputation. Another potential consequence is the curtailing of work pass privileges, meaning that the employer will be restricted in hiring foreign employees. And depending on, on the sector, this could really impact the business operations of the employer. Okay, so transitioning to post-circuit breakup. So as we're coming to the end of the circuit breaker period, I think a lot of employers are, are probably wondering what they need to do as they resume business. Well, thankfully, the Ministry of Manpower has actually published a new advisory. It's called the Requirements for Safe Management Measures at the Workplace After Circuit Breaker Period. It's available on the MOM website, and I highly encourage all of you to go and take a look. So especially, you know, employers and HR professionals. Um, the MOM specifically has said that they will take action against parent employers, so please do familiarize yourself with this uh, in, in the next week or so. So now we're looking at some of the measures which employers are advised to implement as they resume business. Firstly, uh, safe management measures. Employers are required to implement what they've been calling safe management measures. The exact type of safe management measures may differ slightly depending on the different workplace settings. So for example, if it's a customer facing business or operation, employers and customers should be encouraged to wear masks. You know, the use of self checkouts or contactless payments should also be encouraged. Additionally, a detailed monitoring plan needs to be put in place so that the employer is able to ensure compliance with these safe management measures and to act promptly if there's any more compliance. 
is um, employers should also appoint safe management officers who assist in the compliance with these safe management measures. And uh, amongst their duties, they would also need to keep records of inspections and checks, you know, to see how uh, any non-compliance has been addressed by the employer. If a government inspector actually requests to see these records, these records need to be made readily available to them. Okay, reduce physical interaction and ensure safe distancing at the workplace. So, wherever you resume business, um, employers still need to keep in mind that where employees can perform their work from home, employers must ensure that they do so. So just because circuit breaker is over doesn't mean you know, it's business as usual. It's kind of like a new normal as we slowly adjust back to the situation. So the ministry has actually encouraged employers to make use of technology solutions to allow businesses to continue while employees work from home. Another point that they've emphasized is that all physical meetings should be minimized and should be held virtually instead. This applies both to external and internal meetings. There should also not be any activities um, that require prolonged contact or, or um, a prolonged or close contact, meaning any seminars or conferences, should be uh, postponed or cancelled. Okay. Uh, another point that they've emphasized is that if employers have any vulnerable employees, such as pregnant employees, older employees, or employees with underlying illnesses, special attention should be paid to them and these employees in particular should be allowed to work from home. If these employees do not work in a function that allows to work from home, you know, you could consider redeploying them such that they can now work from home in a different role temporarily. Okay, so for other employees who cannot work from home, employers should take steps to ensure safe distancing, you know, such as staggering work hours, break times, reporting times, departure times, you know, can maintain the, the split team arrangement as well and avoid cross deployment between the two different teams. Another thing is that employers should minimize the physical touch points where possible. So for example, if there's like a switch that's required to be pressed um, to enter a specific area of the workplace and you're able to uh, enable maybe automatic access, you should try to do that to minimize your know, areas of contact. Okay, if physical uh, interaction is required, employers should ensure that employees maintain a one meter distance at all times. If it is critical for physical meeting to be held, ensure that the number of employees is limited to the fairest minimum. So employers with customer facing operations should also try to minimize contact you know, with the public with the customers, and they should try to utilize queue management systems that have been recommended by Enterprise Singapore, you know, such as mobile or self-ordering or payment options. Okay, another obligation would be to support contract tracing. So employers should actually do their part to support contract tracing requirements. And this includes, you know, encouraging employees to download this Trace Together app. I think you may have heard of it. It's, it's been launched by the government to try and uh, speed up the process of contact tracing in the event that there's a confirmed COVID-19 case. They should also limit the number of people that's allowed to enter the workplace. So this are only essential employees and authorized visitors should be allowed to enter the workplace. Uh, where people are allowed to access the workplace, all entry, including that of employees, should be recorded using this safe entry visitor management system. So we've seen this being rolled out in a few cases over the past few weeks where you can actually scan your information before you're allowed and entry and you just will now be entry. Okay, so employers should also require a personal protective equipment. And this basically means that employees must wear masks in the, in the workplace. And employers, what you have to do, you basically have to provide the mask to the employee. You have to ensure a sufficient supply so that they can change the mask as needed. For example, if the office is very humid, then you then you then need to actually change the mask more often to ensure effectiveness and employees to, to ensure that they have a sufficient supply. Employers should also encourage employees to observe good personal hygiene. For example, you know, encourage your employees to wash their hands regularly. Employers should also ensure cleanliness of the workplace. So this can be done by arranging for regular cleaning of common spaces, disinfecting shared equipment in between use by different employees, and pro by providing cleaning and disinfecting agents in the workplace. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, employers are also required to conduct regular temperature checks. So this could be twice daily or where relevant. And also declarations are required for on-site visitors. Before being allowed to enter the workplace premises, employees and visitors must actually declare their recent 14-day travel history and whether they have been in contact with any confirmed cases or whether they have received a quarantine order, isolation order, stable order, or MC. And the records must be kept by the employer for at least 28 days for inspection purposes. Employers should also ensure that their employees adhere to MOH prevailing travel advisory, meaning they should tell their employees that they should not travel abroad you know, during this period. Where possible, employers should also ensure that each employee visits only one clinic for checkups if unwell. Of course, the employer's actual um, control over this may be limited, but employers should be the part to try and inform and educate employees about this. Okay, employers also need to prepare an evacuation plan in the event of unwell or suspected cases, as well as for other on-site personnel who may be affected by this. If there's an employee who is not well or has symptoms, they should report to the employer and leave the workplace and consult a doctor immediately. Employers should report these as part of their safe management measures in case there's an inspection by a government inspector. Okay, if the individual is actually incapacitated or unconscious, what the employer should do is clear the area of other personnel and try to administer aid immediately by calling for an emergency ambulance. Where there's a confirmed case, uh, employers will actually need to follow up and have a follow-up plan. So this means that the employer will need to have a plan to cordon off the area and to carry out thorough cleaning and disinfection and uh, of, of the, the area itself and any other areas that were exposed uh, to this particular confirmed case. All right, so that actually is the end of um, my particular presentation. So I'll hand over to May right now. Thank you for that, Bernadette. There's a lot for everyone to digest there. Um, so thank you for that. We do actually have a few uh, follow-up questions, if it's okay, um, just, just off the back of your presentation. Sure. So a couple of clarifications, really. Um, the first one off the top of the bat, right at the start of your session, you had mentioned that um, there's a few uh, places that people can go to to get more um, uh, information on um, on staying up to date on what the legal areas are. And I think you also mentioned newsletters and things that could be subscribed to. Could you could you list a few of those for us? Okay, so I think the main one that um, I think employers and HR would concern in particular would be the MOH guidelines. Uh, sorry, the MOM guidelines and advisories. The MOM actually has a very user-friendly website um, where they actually compile all their advisories on COVID-19. And we've actually seen an unprecedented number of new ones being published over the past few weeks. So that's a good starting point. Uh, another place would be actually the Enterprise Singapore website. That's a useful point as well because that particular website, um, what they tend to do is that they compile the more main advisories and guidelines, and they set up a brief summary there for business owners and employers to take note. So that's a good starting point as well. Uh, in terms of you know legal updates from law firms, um, it, it really depends. The, um, for example, Clyde and Co. We do have one, but I think most other law firms as well they do currently have a running COVID nineteen information hub, um, and and and. And employers can actually turn to their current legal advisors, or if they don't have any, just go to the client website and information will be available there. You can just key in your, your email address and then you'll get updates. Great, thank you. Next question, um, one around definition really. You mentioned in your presentation um, underlying illness conditions. Yeah. Uh, we have we have some questions around what 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 constitutes as underlying illness and conditions. So, for example, would would diabetes count, and would therefore such persons be considered as vulnerable? Okay, so I think the the guidelines itself are very general, and this is intentionally done, or at least I would think it to be intentionally done. I think the idea here is that Ministry of Manpower wants to protect as many employees as possible. You know, so they don't want to actually give you a definition. Uh, black and white to say these people are considered more vulnerable employees and the other employees are not. So I think we just need to be a bit reasonable about this in our assessment. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, 
to the extent possible, if someone with, with maybe a more minor, if you can put it that way, minor underlying illness, if you're still able to redeploy them, that would be for the best. But if you're not, you need to have, you know, make sure you have justification in place, you know, show that effort has been done to try to redeploy this person and speak to the person, see if they're comfortable actually returning to work. And if not, you know, what are their concerns? Is there anything that is rejected? For example, do they feel like they're in a very exposed position where they're in contact with you know, too many people? Perhaps you can try to find a different position uh, within the workplace itself. Uh, but basically, what MOMRC sees is that employers are doing their best to protect all their employees and acting them to the extent that it's reasonably possible as well. Okay, so it sounds like there's a little bit of a judgment call there for, for the employers as well. Correct. Okay. Um, then one last thing, but I think it's sort of been clarified in the chat, but I think it's worth to double check from a legal standpoint. Um, on the safe entry system that's going to be implemented, um, the travel declaration piece, if the building management itself uh, is, is tracking uh, folks as they enter, will it be required for tenants themselves to also be tracking the same thing? I think tenants should definitely be uh, also try to track the same thing. And the reason for this is because the obligations are on the employer specifically. So even though you may try to rely on, on the building management itself to try and ease your burden, ultimately you have that duty and you don't want to be caught lots of time. So you should still, to get extent possible, try to carry this out on your end specifically as well. So I think the, it sounds like it's very much uh, better safe than sorry, so it's good to have a good auditing trail. Exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so what I think I'll do right now is I will ask our two lovely gentlemen, uh, Kenneth and Alvin, to join us on the panel. Um, so Alvin and Kenneth. Uh, what we'll do is Bernadette will ask you to stay on as well, so that we've got a, a lovely three-way panel going on here. Um, and we'll continue to be taking participants' questions, so don't worry, uh, we are keeping an eye uh, on the chat box as well. So Alvin and Kenneth, thank you for joining us today. So just to kick off, um, we, we, we've got a lot of questions uh, so far around uh, the legal elements. Um, and I'm personally also curious, because we've had some questions around this too, how do you feel that HR and the leadership are performing thus far in, in this pandemic um, and in terms of their uh, care of duty to employees? Um, so Kenneth, perhaps I can ask you to comment on the leadership element and Alvin, may I ask you to comment on the HR fraternity? Thank you, May. Um, I'm actually quite impressed with leaderships uh, in Singapore as well as around the world in how they have been actually exemplary in leading by example, as well as really demonstrating the, the personal care on their side. I've seen very uh, clear example, in fact, some very touching ones that are posted about how leaders have uh, gone out of their way to really show care for their employees, despite very challenging economic situations. So I think this is a very good example for us as leaders, as HR practitioners to follow and in fact take this time to develop our own leadership skills as well. So personally, I'm very impressed and I am very touched. Thank you, Kenneth. Alvin? I think um, I'd like to echo similar words like what Kenneth has said. I think the HR fraternity has really stepped up to the plate. You know, we've been asked and caught, uh, put by different sites over this period of time. Uh, though some organizations uh, got off to a, a little bit of a rocky start uh, in, in the beginning of uh, COVID-19 itself, when it started to come uh, stream into Singapore itself. You know, but overall, I think the HR community has really uh, uh, stepped up to the plate. And I think the rocky start was alluded to the fact that, you know, when, when organizations plan for PCP plans and so forth, you know, HR has always been just a support function and it's never been a strategic partner in that planning space. But I think over this COVID-19, uh, it has dawned on many organizations that, hey, look, you know, when we come to talk about VCP plans and so forth, I think HR needs to be at the table 24-7 uh, to really help look at it from a strategic perspective, you know, and not just be an uh, order taker or a timekeeper for that matter. 
So I think uh, kudos to all HR professionals out there. I think we have really stepped up to the plate. Mm. Thank you, Alvin. So um, I, I do agree that I think we're, we're doing well, but um, there are still a few areas, I think, for improvement as always. Um, two areas that seems to consistently be coming up with, uh, with our listeners is around um, employee engagement measures and employee motivation uh, measures. So just, I know this is sort of steering a little bit away from the employment um, law conversation, but I think it's also important for us to keep up to date on this because it also hinders on effective communications of, um, of all the legal uh, measures that Bernadette mentioned earlier. So just very quickly, Kenneth, um, from your perspective, what are a few sort of key top pointers that you can give to our listeners uh, to make sure that they're engaging, motivating, and effectively communicating well, particularly on their BCP measures and any sort of um, initiatives as they're rejoining the workplace in future uh, around the transitions? Yeah, May, I think communication is really key during this period. Uh, as you know, we are all socially isolated in our homes, uh, even away from our friends. So, so the the social isolation is creating quite a bit of challenge for all employees, including the managers themselves. So over this period, I would say that communication has to be done in a uh, oval, overly sense, yeah, as to what to communicate, when to communicate, and even how to communicate is really important. So from what we at CIPD has been recommending to our members and our clients is really the information to communicate is really important to keep it at a big picture level to show them the context the situation and as well as the progress yeah so that employees are kept abreast in a very transparent sense and the frequency during this period really should be done in a much higher um, uh, frequency than normal in fact, uh, some call this a pulse. Yeah? You've got to have a regular pulse in communicating with our employees who are distributed in their homes. So some uh, advocate, say, a daily huddle, or weekly uh, meetings. Uh, so the frequency is as important as the message. But to me, I would recommend that the style of communication is actually most important during this period. You know, we recommend not really using a very formal approach because we are all facing unknown uh, anxiety. So the style of communication is really important to demonstrate trust, authenticity. And so uh, a conversational style like what we are doing now is absolutely critical. In fact, uh, I've learned to use a storytelling style a storytelling style of communicating with your employees create a lot of human interaction. It brings in human touch to this very uncertain time. So if you ask me, communicating is not as simple as before. You really need to look at what, how, and when you communicate. Lovely. Thank you for that. I think I, I would agree. The storytelling method seems to be better, and particularly during this time when when some of the, uh, the elements that we're looking to communicate, especially around the legal pieces that Bernadette has mentioned, um, they can be quite sensitive. So I think it allows HR to have a more empathetic uh, stance on this. Um, Alvin, so a question for you. Um, and still going along the lines of performance management here. Um, mm. we, we do have uh, a lot of organizations out there that are revenue and sales driven, and uh, they will have quite strict KPIs. Um, in terms of what's currently been set. So what's, what's a pragmatic stance here where you've got targets that need to be met, but uh, employees are struggling to meet these KPIs due to current conditions. What's, what's the best way to go about this to manage that performance issue? Right. Um, not an easy question to, to, to give, provide an answer, but I think first and foremost, you know, I think, uh, COVID-19 is, is what we term uh, as a black swan event, all right? And, I, and I, I strongly believe in that whatever we had set budgets in 2019 itself for to be run in 2020, 
I think as employers, we really need to have a good uh, rethink and reflect upon these indicators, you know, uh, especially the hard numbers that we want to measure uh, and paying close attention instead to, to look at uh, and balancing out perhaps maybe, you know, measuring uh, physical health of my employees versus economic health of my company, you know, life versus livelihood position itself. Uh, you know, uh, rather than measuring the, the, sub, the, the, sorry, the form of it, which is the numbers, perhaps employers should measure the substance of it, meaning that, you know, uh, as such as an employer itself, you know, uh, I could actually things measure like instead, you know, things like effort, things like initiatives, uh, number of initiatives conducted and uh, during this period to still drive goal, uh, the goals itself, uh, potential of my employees to, to take on leadership roles and uh, qualities itself, you know, rather than just focusing on the end output, which is the form of it, which is the numbers. And I, I think at this point of juncture, it's, it's, um, it's pretty hard, all right, to still try to want to force an issue uh, on our employees to still run for the numbers at this point of time, right? And I think at the end of the day, you, as an employer itself, perhaps also the key question is that, what would my employees think of me if I was to still continue to drive hard on these hard numbers itself, all right? So I think value-based um, competencies, like effort, initiative, potentials, I think these are things that employers should actually look at instead of just on the numbers itself. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm asking you the tough questions because I know you have a banking background here. <laughs> so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna stick with this for, for a moment, if you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, one other question that we, we have had that sort of goes along this ilk is um, folks are trying to balance, um, you know, the financial pressures and the costs that COVID has presented with trying to make sure that they treat the staff fairly and they're rewarding the staff during tough times. Um, what's your advice here in terms of how, how best to balance this? Because this is, this is a tricky one. Yeah. You know, um, I work in, in various financial institutions in the past, you know, and I think at the end of the day, um, senior leadership teams or organizations will really need to take a hard look at ourselves in terms of what are we trying to do by facing all these cost pressures and yet, on the other hand, trying to safeguard jobs and our employees itself. So just to give you an example of what, has, what we have done previously, or rather a, a team of us have done uh, while, in, while we were in the banks together itself, you know, we took a hard look at our budgets, all right, and we really scrapped it down, and we actually stripped out all unnecessary spend, including our, you know, as you go up into the senior management in the banks, we get perks like transportation, perks like subscriptions to clubs, and so forth and so forth. You know, and also we have all these auxiliary services that we have outsourced. I think we actually took a very hard look and asked ourselves, do we still need all this? How much money can we save by scrubbing out all this itself? And management actually took a, a, a firm position to strip this all out. And at the end of the day, we managed to save not just a couple of thousand dollars. We managed to save close to at least 10 million over dollars over the entire group. And that was how much money we actually managed to save. And in return, we actually used this money to save jobs instead. You know, I think at the end of the day, it's all about, as what Kenneth was saying about leadership itself, it's all about that leadership mindset to really want to take a hard look at ourselves and really go through line by line on the budget line and to scrub out all this, you know, on top of, you know, uh, having management take a, a rich cut as what we are seeing a lot of, our, of the organizations are doing. But I think we can do more on that front itself, right? And, and to really strip out all these fancy perks uh, itself, you know, uh, during this period of time, so as to ease off on the financial costs uh, and, and to support our staff, right? And I think it goes a long way with our employees uh, if they know that the management has actually taken steps to do all this itself. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the tough questions for a moment um, because these these are things that are important to 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 our listeners. So Kenneth, um, I'm gonna bring you back here for a moment. So on on the lines of performance management, and this is still something that is um, is bothering the listeners. So if we just use sales again as an example, so 
is this, a, it, it, you know, they've got KPIs that are set and they have to, you know, meet the, their performance uh, measures uh, and their KPIs in order to hit targets. So a lot of organizations right now are also struggling with um, keeping the, the business afloat and whether or not they need to go down the lines of, you know, retrenchment, redundancies, et cetera. So two questions really. One is what's the best way to approach this if, if, if they're not meeting KPIs? I mean, is, does it warrant enough that this is a, a tough enough circumstance that we should be relooking at what KPIs have set pre-COVID uh, and considering this is now the situation that we're in during COVID? Is, is it fair to keep people to the same KPI measures uh, that was you know, previously set, part one? And part two, um, what are your thoughts you know, on what organizations can do other than going down that redundancy track? Oh, I'm starting to hear the word redundancy. You are, but we'll have to ask the tough questions here. No, firstly, I must say, you know, Elvin gives a perfect example of storytelling communication. And I, you know, I instantly felt the closeness to Elvin as he communicate. So, you know, storytelling works, yeah, for the folks on this, on this panel, try this. Uh, so first on the question of performance management, I want to link it to motivation. Motivation of the employees, uh, is, it goes hand in hand with performance management. An employee who is not motivated because they feel that the targets are not achievable, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to create benefits for both the company and the employees. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, there are during situations like COVID where some employees are not able to perform their staff and have too much time on their hands. So we create a situation where there are overworked, overstressed uh, employees and there are underworked but equally stressed employees. So how I would, how I would manage performance management goal setting during this stage is to approach. One is I will set, in fact, reset short-term objectives because short-term objectives uh, changes as a situation externally change. Yeah? So as agile leaders, I want to encourage all of us to practice the ability to adjust short-term KPIs. Like our company, uh, everybody is being locked down now. So there's no opportunity to say conduct face-to-face -face training. So what do we do? Uh, we have no choice but to be creative, coming up with virtual learning structure. And what we do is in the short term, we created new objectives for our teams to get them to develop new learning programs virtually over a very short period of time. And guess what? They managed to do that they are able to then governize their motivation up again and actually achieve level that we never thought before. So it creates two benefits. It creates benefit to the employee themselves. The motivation confidence level goes up. The company's business actually will have a positive outcome as well. Now, that's only one part of the equation. The other part I would recommend as we do performance management during this stage is equip our staff. As we challenge them with new objectives, new goals, we need to be mindful that they may not have all the necessary skills. So if we manage performance in the form of upskilling them, changing of objectives, we will be able to shift them back in what we call positive psychology into the flow state. When an employee and the organization operate this way, you will see positive outcome for the employee and the organization. So I hope that answers the first part of your question. So you're very tough, you give me two parts. Uh, the second one is tougher, right? So you talk about redundancy. Um, you know, to an employee that is being made redundant is definitely one too many, yeah? So I would really like to address it more as how do we really look at avoiding unnecessary redundancy? Because um, as leaders, uh, as Elvin mentioned as well, we cannot be looking only at pleasing our shareholders. More and more so organizations, leaders are looking at taking care of stakeholders. 
The stakeholders include employees, your suppliers, your business partners, your customers as well. Like during this stage, if you are landlord, you don't take care of your tenants, it's going to affect both your short term and long term business. So what I would say uh, is before you even consider an option like redundancy, you may want to think of uh, a few approaches. And these are the practices that I have used, experienced in my career. And let me share with everybody that this will not be the final crisis that you will see in your career. <laughs> you know, I have seen the Asian financial crisis, global financial crisis, uh, and each time the word redundancy come about. Uh, and we have, through my experience, found that there are three approaches or three considerations that could we as leaders could consider before we even talk about that. I call this the redistribution of pain, redeployment of staff, and the reinvention of your services. First, there will be pain. The question is how can we redistribute the pain so that no single group, no particular person is being targeted. Can we spread, distribute the pain? In fact, make, take leadership, uh, have a bigger pain. Yeah. So by redistributing it, it allows greater continuity that will allow short-term pain to be able to manage over a longer time. And of course, that could become in a form of pay freeze, unpaid leave and the host of instrument that we as HR practitioners can use. And secondly is of course the redeployment of people. I mentioned and I know most company has the situation where there are people who are stretched and then there are those that have spare capacity. Uh, I know companies where we deploy HR practitioners to the front line. Singapore Airlines, for example, deploy their flight attendants to the healthcare industry. All these are great examples to avoid unnecessary retrenchment just by simply redeploying our staff. And of course, the last one is reinventing of what we can do, our business model or services, which you can see loads of examples out there. Yeah, every industry is reinventing themselves and Guess what? You may not need to come to the dreadful question of redundancy, which may not be necessary. So if you practice this approach, let me assure you that you can carry on to future crises as well, yeah? which is my personal experience going through few crises in my career. What do you mean? Very nice. Thank you. I like that. So really, it's very much about short term pain for long-term gain. So folks, three things to remember, redistribute, redeploy, and reinvent. So just a quick summary there, a lot of good points. So um, Bernadette, I'm very worried that, we're, that you're feeling unloved right now. So let me come to you for a moment. Um, so still on the line of redundancy here. One of the questions that we've had a few times come up um, around redundancy, are there any differences in terms of how you would administer, uh, should we have to, uh, in terms of redundancy? Uh, between a local versus uh, an expat employee? Okay, so for this question, I think there are two main parts. You know, first, you have the legal aspect. The legal aspect, no, there's not much difference between the two. Ultimately, employers should take note of two things. Firstly, the assessment contract. You know, what assessment contract says about redundancy or termination? Are there any applicable contractual retrenchment benefits that have been inbuilt into the contract? That's not so common these days, but for older employment contracts, there may be such a package involved. Uh, the second part would be the travel type guidelines on responsible retrenchment. So these generally also apply to foreign employees as well. So to the extent possible, employers should definitely take note of these guidelines and try to implement the, uh, the measures that have been stated there, including the retrenchment benefit, which is roughly about uh, two weeks to one month per year of service, depending on the sector and the financial status of the company. Of course, you know, during this period, everybody has been financially affected, so that's probably something that the ministry will take into account uh, if, if there is actually a formal complaint from the retrenched employee regarding that retrenchment package. Uh, next, it's more of a practical issue here. And for employees, uh, foreign employees in particular, that's where we see the difference between the process 
So foreign employees, they come to Singapore, they're typically on an employment pass or some other work pass, and then there are some logistical issues in the retrenchment of these foreign employees. Uh, for example, the first issue is a tax clearance issue. And this is more of a timing thing because the employee will actually need to clear their taxes before they can leave the country. So just to think about that as you are starting your retrenchment exercises. Uh, next would be more uh, post retrenchment, basically the cancellation of the employee's work pass. Okay, so note the process and note the timings and things. That's right. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm, I'm going to stick uh, with you for just a moment because we had a few more questions come in regarding the new SMO role. Okay. Okay. Right. So a um, couple of questions here. One is um, how, how frequent do you expect this SMO role to be doing audits in the organization? Well, to be honest, they haven't actually said much about this. Uh, I expect that possibly the MOM will probably uh, publish some FAQs in the upcoming weeks as they start to look further into it. Uh, I think right now, what employers can do, take a middle ground, is to just at least have a plan in place and have a specific you know, a timeline or time frame, um, maybe weekly, that the, that the SMO actually conducts these checks and audits with the organization. Um, perhaps there could be a system where employees actually make to notify the SMO if they notice anything non-compliant, then that could actually take some weight off the SNL shoulders. But I think um, right now, it's probably not going to be too onerous because we don't have much guidance on what anyone expects. So I think at the barest minimum, employers should ensure that they have something in case, even if they're inspected, to show that you know, we've, we've done our part, we've tried to, to commit to this to the extent that we're able to, and that we understand how to. But I think um, that's basically what the Ministry of the and in the upcoming weeks, it's good to just take note of if any further guidance has been published. Okay, it is still a very new role, so we do probably expect that there will be some new guidelines around this. So with that in mind, because this is going to be a very, very new role, um, Alvin, yeah. who, who would you recommend that organizations appoint as their new um, officer for this SMO role? I think for, for the appointment, I think, you know, someone that, uh, well, at least in SHI itself, we have actually appointed one of the senior department heads to actually look into all this itself. Uh, someone that is a able to understand the business. Number two is someone that has got the uh, authority to actually look across uh, various departments, you know, uh, especially from the operations perspective. I think, you know, uh, this is uh, the two criteria that we actually have used to identify who to actually be the uh, safety officer here itself, right? Okay, so, so on the safety officer role, then, so I've got a two-part question here again. So I'm going, to need, I'm going to need both Bernadette and Alvin to work together here. So this will be fun. So what happens, okay, if this new SMO officer comes across an employee that is just not, is just not doing what they're supposed to do um, and they keep breaking the rules here? So what is part one, Bernadette, the legal piece here, and part two, uh, Alvin, from a HR perspective, what, what should we be doing in, in this situation if this employee continues to break the rules? Right, but so then we've got a couple of the first part. Uh, from a legal perspective, employees generally do have a duty to comply with the reasonable direction of their employer. So if the employee is actually repeatedly, you know, breaching the or, or going against the reasonable directions of the employer, this, this could be an issue of, of misconduct. I, I, I think misconduct itself may be a bit strong, but um, employers, what they can do is they can just you know, document all these instances, all these specific instances in the event that, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't get better, then you know, we have a record to show that the employer is not going to be behaving in, in accordance with the directions of the employers and take it further and you know, discuss if, you know, this employee can still continue being part of the organization or not. Okay, so from the legal perspective, we document uh, so that we, we're protected. So from so once that's been exhausted uh, and there's nothing else that we can do, we've documented out of our ears. Alvin, what can HR do? I think I think it's what Bernadette said, right? If there is a uh, blatant behavior to keep flouting the, 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 the guidelines and the rules, right? And uh, there's an infringement of the current uh, temporary infectious disease act. I think from a legal perspective, from even for a HR perspective, so I think you have to actually then issue a warning and if if 
if the employee continues to behave in such beta manner, then uh, I think HR has got all the right to then uh, terminate or uh, the employee itself. But before going to the termination, I think from a HR perspective, there are basically about several ways you know that that we can try to instill uh, the proper behavior. Number one, of course, is to develop uh, the policies around it uh, so as to guide and communicate to our employees. Uh, monitor, monitor for compliance to ensure, right? Uh, motivate to instill uh, uh, the required behaviors that are needed, right? Uh, and for leaders to encourage uh, and to ensure, uh, as what Kenneth said earlier on about the the, the communication of our, our, our to our employees itself, and partner, right? As a business partner, to keep watch and make sure that uh, everyone is aligned to the new the new norms itself, right? I think we've. Uh, with the policies, with the monitoring, with the motivation, I think the people will definitely adhere to uh, the necessary guidelines itself. Mm -hmm. So another nice free part there. So what to do if the breaches keep happening from your employees uh, as HR and as employers, what can you do? One, make sure your policies are up to date and keep guiding people. Two, make sure you monitor and you motivate the right behaviors. And three, make sure you partner and be vigilant uh, within the organization. This will help us to to curb that. Okay, so we're coming into the last um, 10 minutes. So we've been addressing a lot of the current issues that have been happening in the organizations around the law component. So where I would like to move to next is, uh, imagine we are now in that state where we are returning. This is gonna happen, uh, hopefully for most of us in, in, in the next couple of weeks, um, if all goes well. And the numbers have been looking good, so we are really hoping we're on that right trajectory. Um, Kenneth, in your view, what do you think are the, the critical measures for HR to note um, as they assess the organization's appropriateness to return back to work? Um, I think, the first of all, safety will be most important. So we need to make sure that the employee's safety and well-being is going to be taken care of. Uh, what we have at CIPD, we actually have a three-step test and we publish it as a guide for organizations to assess, you know, as employees around the world actually are getting prepared to return to work. I call this the, is it essential? Is it uh, safe enough? And is there a mutual agreement? So first of all, is it essential? Uh, I think as Bernard did say, under government guideline, uh, you know, the plan is not to have everybody go back to pre-COVID days. So as employees uh, continue to work from home, it could be an ongoing uh, business practice. So is it essential is the first question you want to ask yourself. And is it safe enough? And Bernadette mentioned that as well, all the safety measures that the government guidelines have put in place. Organization has also done that. In fact, we encourage organizations to have a assessment, an assessment of your own safety standard even before uh, thinking about it. And then the last step, the last test I will call this uh, really important as well. Is there a mutual agreement? Now, because this uh, encompass safety, personal health issue, uh, a good management practice is really to have mutual discussion and understanding. For example, public transport. Is the employee comfortable going back to work on public transport system? So these are examples of conversations that need to happen even after your assessment is done. So I call it the, is it sufficient? Is it essential? Is it sufficiently safe? And then is that mutually agreed? That's lovely. Lovely three points then. Thank you for summarizing. So just a very quick one because we had a question uh, off the bat there. Where you said about commuting. I mean, a lot of people are very anxious right now, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks time when they do need to return to work. So if, if the employees do feel anxious about that returning, what can an employer do? Yeah, I'm not sure about other company, but for us, we certainly want to make sure that the two extremes of employees are taken care of. There are those who are dying to go back to work, so to say. <laughs> they, they, they are you know, so stuck at home. And then there are those who are so unwilling to go back to work. 
So we have to take these two equations and figure out how we can best manage it as an employee as well as, as the organization. So dialogue is important and there are many options around it. Staggering hours, uh, having very flexible travel arrangement, work arrangement, all these are part of that conversation we need to have. Yeah, so, so again, the three tests has been proven to work if you just consider it from both the organization's view and the employee's view. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Alvin. Yes. We've had a lot of conversations, and I know this is right at the top end, you know, um, whether they even mention about this new norm. Um, and I know that, you know, as organizations are settling back in, a lot of folks feel that a lot of good practices have come out. A lot of good innovation has come out over the last couple of months um, because of uh, Circuit Breaker. So what do you feel that HR and leaders can do to make sure that we, we don't go back to the norm pre-COVID and that we can continue to shift mindsets and continue to create innovation and productivity through new practices and new ways of working. How do we make sure people don't settle back into an old mindset? Well, I think we are into what, 41, 42 days of the circuit breaker. And I think, you know, most of us, if not all of us have somewhat gotten used to the new way of working. And currently the new way of working is basically remote telecommunicating, you know, using various technology itself. Uh, be it Zoom, Teams, webinars, uh, sorry, uh, WebEx and so forth, right, for communication purposes, for engagement and so forth. So I think the key question here is also to ask ourselves, uh, is it working? All right. What is working well and what's not working well? And what can we improve upon based on this current set? Uh, that's what Kenneth was alluding to. I don't think COVID-19 is going to go away in an instant, all right? Uh, not just because the weather is going to turn warm, that the thing will disappear, right? Uh, quote unquote. Uh, but the key thing is that, you know, organizations need to weigh in on this very important key issue. Physical health of our employees versus economic health of our organization. I think this is a very, this is a balance that our employers will, we will need to have for that, that tension to balance it out, right? And I think, a few key points on how, how not to go back to the old ways of working. Number one, definitely a mindset change is needed. Two, all right, what of the workflow management can we improve upon? What of the workflows can we control, measure, and what aspect of it can we actually use technology to digitalize work and make it more effective and efficient itself? Right? I think these are the four key uh, areas that organizations will be looking at and for HR itself, right, to actually look at better and newer ways of working, especially from uh, designing uh, roles that are befitting uh, for the workforce of the future itself. Okay, so it sounds like this is a good opportunity for us to make sure that if, if we don't settle back into status quo, mm -hmm. this is a good opportunity for us to make sure uh, that we can do things in a different way. Okay. So uh, just one last question here to wrap up this segment. Bernadette, a couple of weeks' time, when we will be going back, what do you feel is you know, definitely the first thing or first couple of things that employees need to be doing as they're resettling back from a legal perspective? What, what data must they make sure that they remember to do? I think uh, one thing that we've been seeing a lot of employees do, and I think that is quite useful, is to relook at your employment policies and your agreements. So I think that this period has exposed you know, a lot of uh, areas that maybe employers have not addressed in their current policies, you know, what do uh, work from home arrangements, for example, what kind of conduct they can expect that, you know, a new process of, uh, you know, reporting streams uh, from a work from home situation. I think employers should actually take the time to address this and make sure that any deficiencies in the current policies are taken a look at and addressed and communicated to the employees, you know, while as we go back to work in, in the event that anything like this happens again in the future. Okay, great advice. Thank you. All right, we're coming into the last minute. So what I'm going to do is come to each of you uh, to ask for one final thought. Um, so in terms of your final thought, I'd like you to give our listeners today, what is that one takeaway that you would like each listener to make sure that they leave with this morning? Because we've covered a lot of ground. So I'm going to come to you first, Kenneth. 
And then I will go to Alvin and then I will leave with the lovely Bernadette. Okay, so Kenneth. Well, it may sound like a cliche, but I'm going to say don't waste a good crisis. Yeah, take <laughs> this opportunity to build your character, your skills. And two particular skills I'd like you to consider resilience and agility. This will carry you through multiple crises that we may all face in our career. Lovely. So be resilient and be agile. Obviously, very future proofing skills there. Mm. Alvin? Well, uh, I think for me, we live in a world that is not going to be the same. 2020 is not only a new year for us, it is also a new decade that is going to be based on new ways of working. Right. Uh, the profiles of our workforce is also changing with the digital nomads coming to the workplace. And the baby boomers, whether I, I, I like, like it or not, are going to exit sometime in this decade. As such, we need to lead with a very transformative lens. Right? So the keyword here is transformative lens. A lens that does not take into account any secret cows right, in terms of work processes and work procedures itself. Right? I think transformation is the way to go for 2020 in this new decade. Mm. Lovely, thank you for that. Great opportunities. And Bernadette, from a legal perspective, perhaps, what, what do you think is, is that one final takeaway that's actually pertinent for everybody? Maybe a more of a practical tip from my end. Um, I think I've already said this during my presentation, but I'd like to emphasize it. You know, we've seen an unprecedented amount of guidelines and text being rolled out over the past few weeks itself. So I think it's very important for HR professionals and employers to actually stay updated and, and make sure that they're aware of what new obligations are that we need to comply with, basically. Mm. Okay, stay up to date. Wonderful. Okay, so, um, dear listeners, we're coming to the end of our hour. Uh, we do hope that we can do more of these for you because it seems the feedback has been fantastic. So do keep encouraging us with that lovely feedback coming from the chat box and we will make sure that we serve you more. Um, so just to round up, uh, I'm going to ask my colleague to share some very useful links with you uh, to help you stay up to date. And there they are, a massive list of them that's just popped up on the chat box. Thank you, Jury. Um, and my second present to all of you before I leave, we will be sharing Bernadette's slides with you uh, because I know a lot of you have been asking uh, for that. So I'm, I'm very happy to be able to deliver that. So I would like to extend my thank you to all of you for joining us and to Bernadette for your lovely presentation. Very informative. Went down like a storm. Um, and to Kenneth and Alvin for your extremely insightful, practical uh, and pragmatic tips today. So have a good rest of the day, everyone. Um, and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.